Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, the greatest live broadcast on all of YouTube, of course. And tonight is the final episode of Season 11. This is where we take a look at the drawings that we've created this season, and we give them each a quick critique. So we're going to try to... to sprinkle in some art instruction as we take a look at the artworks that we created here throughout the season and like always i'm joined by my good friend and fellow artist and art teacher ashley who's sitting right over there how you doing this evening ashley i'm doing great matt thank you for asking i'm glad to see a lot of familiar names and faces out there in the chat box already so um if you've got questions ask and uh, of course we'll be asking and answering some questions we have about our own artwork tonight so lots of fun absolutely um so Ashley's already told you that if you are watching this live on Utah, YouTube, there is a chat box. You can, of course, ask questions and post comments. Uh, if you do have a comment or question that's directed at us and you want it to be featured and seen, then we encourage you to, of course, use the super chat function. Uh, that will get your comment prominently displayed. It'll get you a little animation from us. And it'll also show your support for the channel and what we do here uh, each and every week for Getting Sketchy. So we really appreciate it if uh, you use the super chat function for that. And of course, if you like this kind of stuff, then it's helpful if you give it a like. And also yes. if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, that would be awesome if you did that too. It's real easy, it's free. And uh, if you click on the notification bell, I think most of the time YouTube will notify you when a new video is posted or when we go live, of course. So it's always helpful to click that notification bell too. I think subscribing just adds to adds to you as a number. I don't really think YouTube will notify you anymore. So I think that you probably need to uh, click that bell too after you subscribe so you're notified, of course. And if you want to take your drawing and painting skills to another level, of course, we would encourage you to check out the membership program over at thevirtualinstructor.com. There you will find tons of courses on a variety of subject matter and media. We cover pretty much every subject matter and media you can think of. We also do weekly live lessons, which are quite a bit different from getting sketchy. These are longer uh, demonstrations, drawing and painting demonstrations that are usually carried out over several weeks. They're presented in real time and we create finished pieces of artwork there. And you get access to the entire library of recorded live lessons, which go all the way back to 2012 when I first started streaming on the internet. There's also a weekly critiques as part of the members minute. There are now close to 450 of those now and those are very valuable and then there's also a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers that includes everything that you would need to teach besides your warm body of course uh, so that's all the resources everything that you would need so of course i encourage you to check out the membership program there's a link in the description below to check it out everyone starts out with a week-long trial for free but if you want to just check out three of the course videos and ebooks, you can do that as well. There's a link for that in the description below as well. And that will also put you on our mailing list so that when new videos are posted, of course, um, we can share it with you uh, through email. So uh, I would encourage you to do both of those things, actually. Um, I think that's it, but I do see that we have a super chat. Yes. So I really Jen, appreciate that, uh, Jen. I don't have the animation on this particular oh my screen. Gosh. <laughs> so yay we'll we'll do yeah, our yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and when we switch over maybe Jen I says thank you for another great season and uh we appreciate that and uh, we feel like it was a great season too it was a um you know it was a good theme i think for matt and i to work with and to uh, uh, re refresh our ourselves about some of the artists that we featured and talk about it with you guys yeah, absolutely. This season has been really fun and informative because this season we focused on art history and all the artworks we created this season were in the style of a particular artist. Of course, we chose our artists and uh, we did actually 11 artists this season, but the 11th artist, uh, Marcel Duchamp, we're not going to feature him in the critique part. We're not going to talk about the vacuum. We're, yeah, we're not going to talk about the vacuum. Okay, yeah. um, I see it over there. Yeah, that piece really sucked. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh. Anyway, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, you can go back a couple episodes and watch that video. And speaking of which, I realized the other day that uh, up to season four, I was publishing the, the videos that we created on the website as I was, uh, you know, as we were recording them. 
and since the end of season four, I haven't published any of the Getting Sketchy episodes on the website over at the blog. And it's so much easier to find. It is so much website. easier. It's, yeah, a, yeah. it's a nicely packaged. You can right. Them in order. You don't have to search around, right. look at the dates, and figure out what came first right. in terms of well, uh, the season episodes. Well, theoretically, because <laughs> I, I've been working on a new format so that I could get all of the episodes from one season on one page. And I've been working hard on the coding and uh, you know the arrangement and everything on the page. And it is just about finished. So. Uh, tomorrow I'll be publishing season five and then hopefully over the next course day, it, the next few days, I'll be publishing season six, season seven, season eight, season nine, season 10 and season 11. So that yes. is a lot of videos and a lot of content that I'm getting ready to be publishing over on the blog. So if you haven't checked out the website again, the virtual is where you need to go. Um, and, uh, you'll, you'll be able to get all of the getting sketchy episodes at least in packaged as a season. Season, starting with season five. Uh, so I'm excited about getting that information out to you and all of those videos as well. And I see that we have two more super two chats. More super Mary chats. Elizabeth Alone Word says, love season and review day. I learned so much. Thank you so much for that, Mary Elizabeth. We re really appreciate it. And Brenda, thank you, Brenda. Uh, says Faye from the season, Edward Hopper. She's already made her her choice. Yep. Framed and in my dining room. So it was your drawing oh that boy. you created in the style that of Edward Hopper. Great. I yeah, love that. that. Is fast. It's husband, already on the wall. Husband loves it. Great season. Comet relief at times too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they, sometimes we're funny and don't mean to be. Um, it's great that your husband loves it too because honestly, my, my wife is my biggest art critic. Uh, she herself was an artist. I say was an artist because she didn't really practice anymore, but she was an artist architect and an interior designer and did wonderful colored pencil renderings uh, when she did that job. Um, but she is a very strict critic. And when I take artwork and show her what I've done, um, I can tell immediately whether or not she really likes it or not, because she's very honest and forthcoming. So hopefully your husband's like that and loves your piece like that as well. Um, so anyway, it's great to hear. I think we might be ready to get into the critique. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the pieces in order. We're going to talk very briefly about the artists that we chose, but really we're going to focus more on the artworks that we created. And uh, for those of you who don't know or haven't experienced a critique before, Critique is an important process or important part of learning to be a better artist in college classrooms. And when I taught high school, I know Ashley does the same thing in his classroom. We have critiques as a group where students present their artwork and then we as a class discuss the positive aspects of the artwork and the negative aspects of the artwork too because it doesn't have to be your artwork that's being critiqued to learn from the critique process. In fact, you pick up a lot from just analyzing the artworks of other people. That's why the Members Minute is such an important and invaluable part of the membership program because there's a critique every week. Um, and tonight you're gonna get a little taste of that critique. We're gonna go very quickly on each piece of artwork because we have 10 pieces of artwork to take a look at. So uh, there's just a little brief synopsis of what you can expect with critique. So let's go ahead and switch over and we'll take a look at uh, the first oh. piece we're gonna critique. Do you have that animation button available? Oh, let's see. No, I don't. Oh, no. Oh, I'm not, I'm totally, oh, no. I'm sorry. I just have to, what? Well, I just have to make the noises tonight. Uh, <laughs> And then I'll make a note to myself to include the animation on all the all the pages and screens that I have set up for this broadcast. So, um, so that's we'll, my we'll fault. Just move our mouths like like a ventriloquist. Uh, uh, it's probably time for me to update that animation anyway, since um, our mouths are now attached to our heads. <laughs> so anyway, this was the first part artwork of the season. Uh, this, of course, uh, was in the style of Andy Warhol, and uh, we discussed when we did this episode um, how Andy Warhol was a pop artist and uh, created images that reflected popular culture. And uh, so what I did is I used um, Posca markers, actually, to create this image, and uh, it's a portrait of Andy Warhol. So uh, real quickly, when I'm looking at this, there's some things that I wish I would have done differently. Um, actually, one thing that I didn't notice until after the broadcast was over, which might be kind of a minor thing, but um, I wanted there to be a pattern on the tie. I wanted there to be a dotted pattern on the tie, mm -hmm. and I left that out. I, in, my, um, in my plans, that was gonna be part of the piece, and I left it out. So um, that's one thing that probably no one would 
ever notice. Yeah, I mean, but, you knew it wasn't there, right? But no one else had thought to imagine it there and compare the finished results to that. And, and it's, a, you know, it's pretty far away from our focal point, so I don't think it really uh, takes away from the art. You do have pattern around the tie already, mm -hmm. it's sort of a visual anchor. You know, pattern creates a little bit more visual weight, and so I don't think it takes away from the piece overall, even though maybe it would be your preference. Right, for sure. Um, it, I was fairly happy with this piece. The The thing that I would change about this piece mostly is the mark making in the facial features. Um, I was using the Posca marker um, in these areas. And of course the Posca marker does have kind of a, or one of the markers I was using has a finer tip, but still spot parts of the skin look a little splotchy. And since this is pop arty, I would have probably preferred to have those lines a little bit crisper and cleaner and not had some of the stray marks that I applied there. So uh, that's something that I would have obviously changed about this piece. I like the way that I use colors in this piece. It's mostly primary. The only exception is the green background. The green background does contrast the red in the glasses and uh, the red on the tie, which makes those colors feel a little bit stronger. But for the most part, if you exclude the green I used a primary color scheme which is mostly a tr uh, which is a color triad uh, of colors that are positioned equal distance from each other on the color wheel um, mm -hmm. there's some areas where you can see some of the the marks on the surface um, which you know kind of lends its uh, kind of is a, a little bit of a mar on the craftsmanship but again I was working quickly since we only had 45 minutes and and you know it's in it's it's in the style of Andy Warhol, which would have been a, some sort of a print. And you, were, right. you weren't printing at all. It was all with mark making. So, right. Um, and I think that's probably why, uh, you know, you don't appreciate the mark making because it deviates a little bit from what we see in Andy Warhol's work. Yeah. And more screen printing. Yeah, I think that's a good observation. So uh, anyway, that was a, I think that was a, this was a good piece to to kick off the season yeah uh, because it is a recognizable style it's still in the same style as andy warhol with the exception of the mark making and of course the process uh, but we can't replicate exactly what andy warhol did in 45 minutes um, but anyway uh, i do think also when you look at the facial features i i kind of made him look a little bit sad um <laughs> i, I kind of would have hoped to make him look a little bit happier uh, or at least a little bit more at peace. He, he kind of doesn't look very happy. And the colors are are very bright and vibrant. Um, it's so, an odd juxtaposition there, you know, with, right. with the, with the uh, really happy, zany colors and then that sort of forlorn expression. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. And I appreciate that comment, Edie, that, uh, uh, that Warhol had... Uh, splotchy skin, which which is true, he did have splotchy skin, but um, nailed it. <laughs> right, <laughs> not not to the extent that I I think I used, I, I added in this particular mm. piece. Anyway, um, I was fairly happy with this, and then uh, the second piece of the year. Or Ashley, what do you have to say about this? I um, I kind of chimed in along the way. I, yeah. I I really like the piece. I like all of the artwork that you made this season, actually. But I thought oh, I do think this was. I mean, you had two portraits in there, and uh, is that right? Two portraits. Um, I gotta think this about that. This one, Picasso, with this year. Oh yeah. Two yeah, portraits. I don't know if yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> so, and they were so different from each other. Oh and yeah. And I think that, I think this is a successful piece, especially for the format on getting sketchy, where we work in forty-five minutes. Yep. Yep. Well, all right. Well, thanks. All right. So let's yeah. move on to Ashley's uh, piece. His first piece of the season was in the style of Van Gogh. That's right. In the style of Vincent Van Gogh, more the style of his drawings. Um, but his drawings and his paintings had a similar, um, they had a similar style in terms of mark making. The mark making uh, was distinct, maybe different from what Matt was going for with the Andy Warhol. We needed all of the marks to show up. And so I pretty much used hatching and I love hatching and Vincent van Gogh loved hatching anyway. So that wasn't a difficult translation for me. Um, I worked in charcoal on toned paper and sometimes van Gogh worked on toned paper as well. So that played into the selection. This was gray paper and I think, I think van Gogh used brownish kind of a tan paper sometimes, but um, nonetheless, uh, it was let lower than white in terms of the value scale, which allowed me to use a little bit of white charcoal in here um, in addition to the regular charcoal. So um, I'm pretty happy with how the drawing went. 
um, as far as subject matter goes, it's nothing like what Vincent Van Gogh would have chosen. Um, although he did draw a bandage on his ear, and these um, headphones do go on your ear. So that's a, as close to his association as I can get. And I thought it was kind of funny to draw headphones um, in the style of a, of a man who only only had one ear. That doesn't mean he couldn't hear out of both ears. You know, he probably had an echo effect or something. Right. Like that. I, I, yeah. you know, <laughs> so maybe the headphones would have helped um, tamping down that echo a little bit. Uh, let's see. There's a nice variety of line quality in here. And we yep. see then in Van Gogh's artwork, very often he would use a little heavier lines around the, around the edges of his contours. And it wasn't very popular to do that kind of drawing or that kind of uh, outlining in his time period, in his day. But it's become really popular ever since. So um, we're used to seeing drawings that have a little bit of heavier mark making around the edges. Uh, it was a little bit shocking, I think, to, uh, to what would have been his audience at the time. So and again, maybe uh, Vincent van Gogh had a role in, uh, in influencing artists that came after him and uh, in, in uh, emulating his style, or at least uh, digesting a little bit of his style and working that into um, our own way of art making. If I had something to do different with this piece, uh, I'm, I might have been a little less careful. You know, the marks are really, really organized. They do follow a cross contour pattern. The direction of mark making that I chose is typically the shorter direction where we see changes in direction where we hit the corners of the object. And uh, it's a little bit... Uh, it's a little tedious, so I might would have been a little bit looser um, with some of my mark making in terms of uh, how I had shaded it in. Well, I absolutely love this drawing. Um, I, when you told me you were going to do a, a charcoal drawing at first, I was like, oh, I'm not sure if that's going to translate as Van Gogh. Yeah. Because uh, in my mind, I thought, oh, if you're going to do Van Gogh, oil pastels in the right. amount of time. You think of his paintings. Right. Uh, but this drawing really does look like a Van Gogh drawing. Mm -hmm. And when you look at Van Gogh's drawings, it's definitely done in the same style. Um, I do agree with a lot of things you said. Um, I'm just going to point out a few of them. Ashley was talking about the line quality. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important to vary your line width. And a lot of times I refer to that as line quality. Um, and you can see that the outer part of the headphones has a much thicker line than some of the lines that indicate some of the details on the inside. And that helps to create the illusion of form in a drawing without having to do a lot of shading. That's in true. fact, if you took all the shading out of this, we would still understand the form uh, where the object gets thicker and so on. And it will give a sense of volume with just the lines that you've added. And you mentioned the, the hatching marks that you used here, very Van Gogh-esque, when, especially when you think about his drawings. Yeah. And of course, that translated over to the paintings with the brush strokes, kind of following the same cross contour uh, direction over the form of the objects. And you created this drawing in, in a manner, in the same manner that we would create kind of a pen and ink drawing, but you're using charcoal in the style of Van Gogh. So it's like... Right. All of these, well, all know, these it's different. Fun, it's interesting you mentioned that because Van yeah. Gogh would draw in charcoal, but he would also draw in ink a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Ink, yeah, uh, sometimes. Uh, but his mark making really didn't change. You know, he was the master of his his medium, not the medium mastering him. So, um, you know, he he applied the same kind of uh, temperament and mark making regardless. But actually, whether he was working with oil paint, with charcoal, or with ink, he was still interested in those sort of short staccato um, marks that uh, remained evident. Um, even to the end of his artwork. Now, one of the advantages to working on toned paper, of course, is that you can add light marks. Uh, so the highlights, I really like the highlights added with the white charcoal in areas. Uh, it really does make a big difference. Yep, just uh, a little bit goes yeah. a long way yeah, know, when it comes to the white charcoal. Right. Uh, expanding the range of value in the piece, of course. And um, also, there's some subtle things that I want to point out. First of all, on the inside of the headphone, uh, we still have these lines out here, but this, they're spaced apart where the gray space in between kind of helps develop the value. And then when we get to the shadowed part, those lines are still there, but they're just thicker. Um, mm -hmm. And I really like that contrast of what's happening right Thanks. here. And also it's echoed down here too, as well, where we got a little bit of light, I guess, kind of reflecting off of the surface, maybe coming back up here. But another thing is the subtle application of some white charcoal in this area, 
and right here mm -hmm. to contrast the shadow and also a little bit of white charcoal out here and a little bit of dark charcoal out here too. So it would have been real easy just to leave the, the paper blank uh, around the outside. I mean, the shadow would have sufficed enough, but those little hints of light and dark value, I think make the drawing feel a lot it, it more complete. It needed a little bit of weight down in that lower right, uh, lower left-hand corner. And so, yeah. you know, I'm really sensitive to the balance of artwork. Um, doesn't mean I always achieve it, but I'm sensitive to it. And so I don't remember if I had planned to put a little bit of the charcoal, the darker charcoal in the bottom left-hand corner, but it felt like it needed it. Um, one thing that I am happy with, and of course, this has nothing to do with the style of Vincent Van Gogh. This is a photo. This was from a reference photo that I took myself, and I took several, and I had the camera close enough to the subject to create a scale difference between the two headphones. You know, they're real close together. We know they're the same size, but I got close enough so that um, uh, the forward headphone is, you know, it feels like it's about twenty or thirty percent bigger, and that gives us a little bit of extra sense of space in terms of using scale and what is otherwise a very shallow space yeah absolutely that's a good observation and the last thing i'll say about this piece is that the diagonal that's created here uh that's mm -hmm. always going to make your composition a little bit more dynamic and that's more true. interesting um so I, I think it's a great piece it turned out great um like i said i was uh I was unsure when you said you were going to do Van Gogh with charcoal. Like, what is he thinking? <laughs> but it, a disaster. It, it was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> it turned out wonderful, and it looks like a drawing that Van Gogh may have created. Yeah, uh, although he wouldn't have drawn headphones. Nope. Um, but I like the play there. Um, all right. Uh, I, then it was my turn the next week after that, and uh, I had Georgie O'Keeffe. And, of course, Georgie O'Keeffe is known for large paintings, of flowers up close among other things so i decided to do a flower of course and to try to mimic the style of uh, o'keefe in some way in a short period of time i decided to use pastels so this is soft pastels and i think i used pastel matte paper if i remember correctly okay um in this piece i was trying to uh, pull out a little bit more color than was present in the reference and i think i succeeded with that in areas um, I like the rhythm that's created by the repeating flower parts. And I don't, I'm not going to say stamens and pistols and all that because <laughs> I don't know which is which, but there is a, a rhythm uh, in this piece uh, right. through repetition. You know, when you want to create rhythm in a piece of artwork, we need to think about rhythm in terms of sound. When we have a rhythm, a rhythm is created by repetition. So when we're creating a visual rhythm, we can create that visual rhythm through repetition. That can be repetition of subjects uh, or elements, or it can be a repetition of strokes that we make or, or so on. So uh, I do like the rhythm of this piece. And I do like that our eyes are kind of drawn to this location, which is not directly in the center of the picture plane, or at least my eyes are drawn to that location. We have the petals um, that we can kind of, oops, I want to pull that out of the way. And that's not the artwork we're talking about. There we go. We'll go back here. All right. There uh, we are. The <laughs> petals uh, are kind of pulling your eye down to that location, along with the parts of the flower, mm -hmm. the middle parts of the flower, the stamens and the pistols, whatever they are, uh, all kind of pulling your eye to that location. Uh, with a more critical eye, I don't really like the spacing around the edges. I feel like this part right here is a little too close to the edge of the picture plane. That needs to be dropped down a little bit further. That's creating a little bit of tension at the top. And then down here at the bottom, this element is too close to the bottom of the picture plane too. These are things that yeah, I... That's, that's tough because you ha you wanted to zoom in to make right. it like an you know, O'Keefe. If you right. had zoomed out much so that those elements aren't close to the edges, it may have actually felt a little bit less like an O'Keefe. The answer might have been to zoom in even more just to take a little bit more of those parts off of the edge. I don't know. Yeah, it, and those are the options. Zoom in a little bit or zoom out. Just crop it differently. Yeah, and you know, I... I crop this earlier uh, and before I did the drawing and I, you know, composed the composition. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are a couple of elements that I should have changed. Um, and I don't, re I don't remember the photo reference exactly. Uh, maybe those were changed in the drawing process and maybe I just got close to the edges oh, then. Uh, but those are some things for you guys to look out for. And those are some things that I'm being critical of myself. One thing that I want to point out here is uh, my value range is not as strong as I would like it to have been. Um, and looking at this with just the colors in place, 
it seems like the values are okay, but uh, I'm gonna duplicate the layer that we're on here and I'm gonna um, take the color out and just minimize this down to just the black and white values. Just the grays. So I'm using the camera raw filter for this, which takes a few minutes to come up. And then I'm just gonna take the color out. And when I take the color out, you can see the areas where I do have a good range of value. And that is on the, these parts. Mm -hmm. The raisins. Right. But you can see the areas where I'm missing a broader range of value uh, right yeah, here. We, we, you got away yeah. with it because of contrast and color. Exactly. They're very similar values. Right. Uh, so I could have created even more contrast um, by, you know, pushing the values a little bit in areas. In fact, some of the pedal edges are completely lost where this pedal meets this pedal. It's completely lost because the values are the same. But when we bring the color back in, we can see that, like Ashley uh, said, the, the color contrast is definitely there, especially with those strong reds that are happening at the bottom. But I could have pushed the value range a little bit further. And the last critique I have of this is, uh, I know I did this in, in a rushed style inside of 45 minutes, but I could have had a little bit better control over the material. Uh, it's a small drawing and I'm trying to replicate a large painting. Uh, so there's a challenge there. But uh, I think with a little bit more time, I could have uh, you know, rendered some of these a little bit crisper and cleaner. And that's just kind of how I am. I like things to be sharp and precise. Mm -hmm. And I fight that in every piece of artwork that I make. But in this particular case, I think that that is a warranted uh, critique. All right. Do you have anything else to say about this one? Um, I would just agree with your comment about the tension at the top of the picture a little bit. Yeah. And even if you deviated from the reference and just pulled those down a little bit, you know, because uh, I think that would have uh, made it more successful. But um, it's not a it's not an unsuccessful drawing. And there are a lot of. Uh, you know, good qualities in terms of the rhythm. And then you didn't talk a whole lot about the color, but we do have some complementary colors in there. Oh, yeah, that that's, make it yeah, exciting, that's true. The purple yeah. and the yellow. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I could have brought out a little bit more of that, though. Um, but yeah, sure. All right, uh, next piece. Ashley did Piranesi, right? All oh, right, yes, the that's right. Piranesi. So, and uh, this was inspired by Piranesi's etchings. So this is a pen and ink drawing, not an etching, because you just can't make an etching in 45 minutes. Um, but uh, you know, etchings and engravings look like pen and ink drawings. So it was a, it was a, I think it translated well in, in terms of uh, matching the style of Piranesi's artwork. I thought a lot about the subject matter and choosing um, and my, my reference. Piranesi drew a lot of sort of scary, foreboding um, prison scenes. And uh, he went back into them later on in his life and reworked those plates to add in more sort of dangling and hanging parts to give it almost a, almost a precarious feel to his composition. So when I found this image of a hanging hook, um, it seemed just right. Not that uh, that uh, it's part of a, a prison scene, but it, it kind of feels it kind of feels like it. All those all those blockier, flatter shapes in the back, really arch architectural. Um, so that was uh, my thoughts in choosing the subject matter. The focal point here is is sort of the the hook contraption. It's a little bit off center. It's up and down on one of the thirds, and the hook itself is kind of on a horizontal third. So I thought that was pretty successful in terms of the composition. And I followed the reference. I mean, I really I can remember while I was making this drawing, feeling like I, I wasn't going to have time to get dark enough in places because the pin marks are pretty, pretty small. You know, they're pretty narrow. Um, so I don't know if I could have, but I would have liked to maybe get a little bit more darkness in the top or top right corner, even if it was different from the reference a little bit. I think it, it could have um, still to have a little bit more contrast out there again um, just to create balance not to take away from the focal point but to just try to balance out the whole the fullness the wholeness of the composition well let's try that real quick um i'm just going to use the uh burn tool here okay and this is just going to give us a little bit of uh a, a darker of value yeah. and it's going to look like it doesn't make sense in the drawing but if we squint our eyes it can kind of give us an idea well let's i don't know if it'll burn those black it's not marks. burning that let's yeah. see here let's uh let's go ahead and uh use a brush then maybe if i can find a brush here there we go 
You could even just use a wide brush and take the opacity down and just put a dark blotch up yeah, that's there. Right. It, won't, it won't match um, the mark making, but we can at Ooh. least see. That's dark. It's too dark. <laughs> All right, we'll bring the opacity down quite a bit. Just make it a little bit darker up here. Yeah, just make like that shape up there a little bit darker, right? That one. To give it another pass. And that, I do agree, if this little section was a little bit darker in value, um, it actually is helping the light part of the focal point feel a little bit lighter. So I, yeah. I'd, I think I'd like to have gone a little darker up there, even if it was different from the reference. And we need to learn, all of us need to learn when is the right time to copy a reference and when should we work away from it to improve our composition. So that would be, um, that would be one of my um, small criticisms for this piece. Well, I, I like the way this one turned out too. I really think that, um, Let's get this back down. And of course, here. I was leaning on hatching a lot again. Did do some cross hatching in here just to mix it up a little bit, but lots of hatching. Um, yeah, lots of hatching. And uh, I think somebody in the chat mentioned that it's busy. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening in this particular piece because there's so many lines. Yeah, there's a lot of and a lot of lines and a lot of angle changes in the back. Right. Um, yeah, and I, I like the angle changes and the directional changes of the strokes that you made with the pen and ink too. Um, we can really see this here where we can, we've got these diagonal lines and then we go to the next plane, they're vertical and then they're at an angle again and then vertical again and then at an angle again. So you're getting contrast between the different sections just by changing your line direction. So in a pen and ink drawing, if you can't really, if the values are similar, you can always change the direction of your mark making to create a little bit of contrast. Of course, a lot of times you want to push the values too and, and push the value contrast. Like you said, you were working with a small tipped pen yeah, in and, a very short period of time. I, another way to create a little bit of contrast, I could have um, brought in a different uh, line weight. You know, I could have used a, a, a wider, slightly wider pen and narrower pen in places just for a little clarity in the background and to add some variety. Yeah, and I think that uh, we can we can do that. I think that part of this is uh, getting the the main element is getting lost a little bit in all the lines in the background. Mm -hmm. um, so if the lines were just a little bit thicker around the edges in some areas it might make this particular element stand out a little bit more so maybe i should have done my piranesi in the style of van gogh <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um well when you're trying to do an etching and i just added a few thicker lines there so you can yeah, see and they the work contrast they yeah. work yeah so uh, line quality can bring out uh, a little bit more contrast there of course and when you ha are dealing with an image like this and you want something to appear like it's closer to the viewer, you can, of course, use thicker lines around the contours to do so. Um, I love all the lines in the background. I do feel like if you had more time, you would give a little bit more variety in the background mm -hmm. and create more contrast. Um, since that element that, uh, since those walls and things are further away from the viewer, I do think that the, uh, the hook needs to be maybe a little bit darker to stand out a little bit more, but I love all the stuff you see in the background. I keep finding myself moving to this area. I don't know how uh, everybody else feels, but I, I kind of am pulled over to this area. There's some, um, let's see, convergence happening there. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are intersecting right here, but that's happening in other areas too. It's that's happening true. down here too. So I'm not really sure, maybe because this area has white space, more white space than some of the other areas. Yeah, maybe that's um, And there's so much going on in other areas um, that I'm kind of pulled to this area for some reason. But uh, but anyway, I think it's a great, uh, a great way to replicate an etching. Uh, although in etchings, do is there a lot of cross hatching used in etchings? Um, it's a, a, a lot of line work, hatching, yeah, definitely and, both hatching and cross hatching. Yeah, it's pretty much the same type of mark making. I mean, you're making the mark through wax, and right? So sometimes yeah. you get um, a, a line if you look really close at it, almost like through a magnifying glass. You know, the lines aren't super smooth on the edges. Sometimes there's a little bit of of um, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. Almost like... Not a sharp edge. Almost, you're right. Almost yeah. like pointy little spiky edges going along the line. So um, that's one little difference. Sometimes an edged line can feel a little soft compared to an engraved line. So it's probably, probably more like an engraving would look. But... Um, 
Yeah, and uh, one one of our folks in the chat mentioned that the fixed line width makes it feel more like an etching than it would be if I had some thicker lines in there. And that's probably true too. Yeah, so yeah, I can see that. In some mm -hmm. ways, you know, um, decisions we might would have made if this were if this were um, artwork not in the style of, uh, we actually avoided some of those decisions just to try to keep it uh, true true to the artist's style. So that was a good comment. All right, uh, and the next drawing, I think, because these are out of order now, uh, <laughs> I did Janet Fish um, with colored pencils and markers. Yes. And uh, Janet Fish is a representational artist um, who creates uh, paintings and um, other media uh, of artwork um, that has reflections and transparency. Uh, uh, and she does a lot of food and things like this. And the whole time that we did this one, I was referring to it as a perfume bottle, but it's actually not. It's a lamp. It's an oil lamp. Um, <laughs> That's why it's got little flames at the top, I guess. Well, maybe so. Is that what so. those are? Yeah, flames? I, it looks yeah. like a crown. Yeah, they're made out of metal. Yeah. Um, anyway, so now that we know what it is, we can <laughs> critique it a little bit more effectively. Um, I really like this combination of media, um, markers, and colored pencils because you can use the markers as a base, kind of like a watercolor underpainting, kind of. And then you can apply the colored pencils over the top. And if you're using the markers and colored pencil combo that I like to use, which are Prismacolor, they have the colors have the same name. So you can match uh, colored pencils colors with the marker color that you used if you wanted to. Um, so markers give us uh, big, bold areas of color down in a short period of time, while colored pencils provide uh, quite a bit of refinement and control over the details. Um, I was fairly happy with this piece. Uh, the uh, Obviously, I, and I don't want to sound like a broken record player, it seems like every piece we look at we say if we had more time but that's you know that's the nature of getting sketchy is we're creating sketches and none of these are really finished pieces of artwork um i wouldn't consider them finished pieces of artwork i would definitely consider all of these sketches um some look a little bit more refined than others based on the medium that we used um but for this piece i was fairly happy with how it turned out I do like um, the orange and blue relationships that are happening in areas. Um, there are some colors that are reflected here. Mm -hmm. And then I used some blue in areas to kind of pull out a little bit more of that uh, contrast. So I used indigo blue in some areas. Um, and then of course, there, we have some of those oranges in areas in as well. And that's creating a lot of contrast and making that metal at the top actually look a little bit more realistic. I also like the use of the Posca marker <laughs> to add the highlights. I have learned that Posca markers are really great for adding highlights, so I don't have to grab that gouache and open the tube and everything. It's I can so just hard. grab the marker and just, right. I, well, the, the, easy gouache, the gouache draws and the tube draws to the top of the, or the, the lid draws to the top of the tube. Yeah. And then I'm like, scraping the skin off my hand to get it off. <laughs> and with the Posca marker, you just the Posca marker, you just shake off. it up. Pop yep. it on there, you you're done. good to go. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I really like this process. Uh, I do think it kind of resembles something that Janet Fish would would create. Sure. Um, uh, the only, the, the main critique I have about this is the shadow. I added the shadow at the very end, obviously, uh, down here. It's kind of a shadow slash reflection. I think if I remember correctly, the, the reference did have more of a reflection and added more of a shadow. It's pretty loose, you can see the marker Marks. I, I would have wished to, uh, I would have wanted to, to clean that up a little bit and make it a little bit more refined like the rest of the drawing. Um, I don't like the seeing the edges of the wick here, now that I know that's a wick, um, on both sides. So I really should have thought a little bit more about where the direction of the light source is originating from and made one side a little bit thicker instead of having two edges that are pretty strong. But I think in the process of going quickly, I made those marks with markers and then just never covered them up with colored pencils. So that would be my big critique. Of course, there's some craftsmanship issues here and there where I've gotten outside of the lines, so to speak. There's some graphite marks that are still visible. Those are things that I could have cleaned up. But I think that this, if I was gonna finish this as a large painting uh, or a larger piece like Janet Fish did, it would have been a really fun piece to create. Yeah. And, um, you know, if we recreated this with acrylics or oils or something like that, it would be a pretty interesting piece of art uh, 
from such a mundane subject. So uh, I was pretty happy with this one. This was one of my favorites from the season. Yeah, me too. All right. You got anything to say about this one? Um, I would have just echoed the same comment about the reflection underneath. You know, it just yeah. feels a little undone compared to the um, how I mean, the the rest of the drawing doesn't feel like it's a getting sketchy drawing. You know, it doesn't feel like it was done in a, a, a rushed uh, sort of time frame because you've got a lot of variety and subtle variety of color and colors right next to each other that are very much almost the same but slightly different so it feels really considered to me it's one of my favorites of the season yeah well thanks um yeah but we need to put that shadow or reflection back in the oven it's definitely <laughs> not done all right the next piece i think was the dolly drawing i think that was the one that got out of yeah that's right out of order we got there. a sneak sneak preview of the dolly drawing so <laughs> Um, this one was an oddball because originally I wasn't planning on doing Dolly and then I decided to do it. And, um, and I thought about the, the clocks and the, the soft clocks or the, what people call the melting clocks painting by Salvador Dolly. It's his most famous artwork. I think it's called persistence of memory, which, uh, of course has, yeah, uh, doesn't use any words, uh, that relate to the, the, the imagery that we actually see in the artwork. So we'll just call it the melting clocks and uh, Dolly was into juxtaposing, um, materials that didn't necessarily go together or um, imagery that is uh, all the same shape, but looks like two different things. And I wasn't gonna go there with Dolly. I'm not gonna come up with a double image because Dolly's got a little more genius than me. Um, but I was able to try to juxtapose a hard material, glass and metal with a soft material like cloth. And so the references, I don't know if they were a help to anybody um, because we were just looking at a regular iPhone in somebody's hand. And then this really scary picture <laughs> I took of a towel from my classroom that we just used to like clean up spills and I had taped it to a whiteboard. Yeah, so, you should have read the comments on the community uh, forum. Uh, uh, it looked uh, like I was yeah. torturing the towel. It was like, <laughs> something like from what Bob are we Green. drawing? It was that? awful. <laughs> It was awful. So I don't know if the references were any help, but it was a lot of fun to make. And it's, I think it's fun to look at the saggy phone. And um, if I were to, to, I used colored pencil on a gray background again. And if I were to do something different with this piece, I think I would do two things probably. Uh, I think that I did a little bit of some like color comparison and drew a little portion of it before the show just to try out colors. And I had used a purple on the screen and then I, and, and look, I thought it looked good. I mean, I thought it looked good with the other warm colors that are in the picture, like the orange and the, in the stakes, they're both secondary colors, the orange and the purple. Um, but then in the reference that I chose, the background was just that sort of non-objective, um, collection of blues um, that we sometimes have seen in like Apple ads. It's a very nondescript blue background color that no one can be um, too happy or sad about or offended about. And so I thought I better go with the sort of that blue that you see on some of the standard um, iPhone ads or at least the ones that I was looking at um, just to make it feel more recognizable as an iPhone. And I think that was probably a mistake. I think I should have stuck with the secondary color, that purple. It wasn't dark, you know, it's the same value as the blue, but I think it worked better um, with the other color that's in the artwork so that's something I would have changed if I could have done it differently and I feel like the you know I got some light or white highlights on the edge of the phone on either ends the two ends of the phone that are hanging out beyond the crutches but then the metal parts that are between the crutches I think I left a highlight out or left some highlights out and they get lost a little bit especially the one on the bottom that gray is very similar to the blue from the screen and I think it just needed uh, more either a low light or a highlight but some way to bring that little edge um, that metal edge feature out well it has an interesting effect which um, once you see you can't unsee or at least for me <laughs> <laughs> and that is, it makes these sections look like they're coming out towards the viewer. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Can you see that? Yeah, I do. Um, now, once you see that's, it, you can't unsee it. Because we know, <laughs> we know it's something that's supposed to be rectangular in our right. brain. And so when we see those, what would ordinarily be parallel edges um, converging towards the crutches, it feels like they're converging towards a vanishing point. And they actually right. look like they're both sides are converging towards the same vanishing point yeah so it does right in the middle right yeah. so that's what's doing it maybe maybe i should have done one end 
um, distinctly different uh, than the other in terms of how it was sort of flopping or floppy or saggy, you know. So that that's a good point, Matt. I also added that um, stray line in the background to create like a a horizon line that's way high in the composition, um, just to try to kind of indicate that there's deep space there. Mm -hmm. And I wish I hadn't put that line in. I think it's distracting. That's just me. Um, but I, I felt like I needed to because I was working in a style of Dali. And so I think the theme of the, the theme of the season got the better of me a little bit. And I added something, um, just to, um, you know, just to better emulate that deep horizon that we usually saw in Salvador Dali's artwork, but I don't think it contributed to the artwork at all. Yeah, I agree with you about the horizon line, and you don't know if it's going to work or not until you put it on there, and then you and know, we do it we're live. doing sketch it, and you did and that we do at the it very with colored end. pencil, and you right. can't take it back. Yeah, you can't go ahead and fill in a background with colored pencil in that amount of time. No, but I do feel like this piece needs it if you were to you know create a finished work from it. Yeah, but um, no one can look at this and not say it is in the style of Dali. I mean, right. you, if you know anything right. about Dali's art, you, you're going to look at this and say, oh, that's that's based off of Dali. And and if you don't know Dolly's art, it looks um, ridiculous, just like Dolly's art looks like sometimes the first time you see it. You're like, what are those crutches doing on the bottom of that elephant? You know, and it, but it's the juxtaposition of typically disassociated Im imagery. That's what uh, sort of Dolly's direction and a lot of surrealist uh, direction in their art making took. Well, a few things about this piece. Um, first of all, it does look like it's metal that's wrapped uh, or metal that's like melting or something. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that you've done that is through the relationships of the highlights and uh, the shadows. You got those strong highlights on there. They're contrasting really strong like we see with metal and reflective surfaces. Um, and of course, we can't mistake this as being an iPhone since we're all familiar with what iPhones look like. We know what they're made out of, so it's pretty clear. Plus, you have some recognizable apps on here that we're used to as well. I think this is Pandora. That's right. And this is X, the company formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> and um, then some other nondescript apps. Um, I'm sure you know what that is, but I don't know what that is. I got, um, I got a green box in there. I think that's messages, maybe. Okay, like okay, that. yeah, right up here. Yeah. Um, anyway, whoever has this phone has like loads of apps <laughs> there's like 12 <laughs> apps in a row there but it's still unmistakable as an iphone mm. um and the i think the the fabric effect is really strong i still can't help but see these elements coming forward <laughs> like, i'm telling you once i saw it like that i was like i can't see it any other way it's funny you mentioned that um some folks in the chat said that in the uh, piranesi copy the background yeah kept switching the direction the perspective felt like it was going like an mc escher right so yeah i saw I've that had all kinds of perspective ambiguity in my artwork uh, uh this season accidentally uh, of course and i just want to say some a couple of things about the crutches because i think the crutches are really successful um, I like the strong highlights that you've created every well, you know year what with I the color. Posca marker. Posca markers. Yeah. Um, and um, I like the broken line that you've used here too, because this is actually colored pencil, Posca markers, and pen and ink. And pen, right. Yeah. Um, and the broken line over here as well. It feels very painterly and loose, yet it's given us enough information to understand the subject, and the style is consistent with what everything, everything else you've done. I do agree that... This piece needs some type of way to ground it uh, beyond just the shadow. Mm -hmm. And I do think you're on the right track or we're on the right track with the horizon line. But this needed, since, needed yeah. maybe some shading back there in the sky or coming down, like soften the horizon line just by, just by shading down away from it a little bit, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. That, that line does. It feels like a, a division between the sky and the ground, but it also is just a line. So. Um, yeah, I agree with, with what you said there, um, earlier, uh, but I think the piece is great as a Dali in the style of Dali for sure. Thanks. It was, it was still fun. It was still fun to make the whole time because we were, we're really working with our imagination. You know, we yeah, had yeah. two references and we didn't draw either one of them, we just picked out the parts that we thought we could meld together. So it was a, it was a great exercise. All right. And I think we need to speed it up a little bit. Uh -oh. Um, I think we got time, but all right. The next one I did was a portrait of Steve Carell. 
<laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, this was my take on Picasso. Um, and I, I worked from a portrait photograph of Picasso um, to create this image. We talked a little bit about cubism and the idea behind cubism and how it's about seeing things or painting things or drawing things from multiple angles at the same time. Uh, that really is what it boils down to. And I used oil pastels here for this. I think I used um, Mitant's paper for this, Kansen, Kansen Mitant's pastel paper. Yeah, I can see the edges. I certainly did. Mm -hmm. um, some things about this piece that I would have changed that I, I didn't really notice until afterwards and I was looking at it. And that's why we go back and critique and look at artworks. Um, first of all, I feel like the head is a little bit too static. Um, it's just right there in your face. It, the subject is giving you the side eye. That eye is looking off to the <laughs> distance. This one's coming towards the Every viewer. Every cubist piece gives you the side eye somewhere, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> um, and that's, that's part of uh, the cubist idea. But um, I, compositionally, it is a little bit too static. Um, if you look, go back and look at Picasso's portraits, the, the heads were kind of tilted in directions. There was, a, there was an element of movement and um, fluidity that I'm losing in my piece. My piece is very rigid. It looks a little bit like a uh, Picasso project, like, Hey kids, we're going to study Picasso. Um, and I raise my hand and say, I'm doing Steve Carell. Uh, I just can't, I can't help how much this looks like Steve Carell. And I think the reason is, uh, the nose is, is, uh, pretty large and long. Um, so I think that's kind of contributing to it. Um, I am getting a little bit of that, that, that dynamic feel by having this ear high up on the, on the head. Um, but I, I should have tilted the head in a different direction or, or positioned the body in a different way. Uh, that's my opinion. I do like the brush strokes um, that are, they're not brush strokes, they're marks made with the oil pastels, but with the um, Sennelier oil pastels, you can really create an image that looks like a painting using the oil pastels. Um, it's some of my color choices I would have done differently, um, like this edge of the nose, I was trying to show the left side and the right side of the nose at the same time. This is too much like a skin tone. Um, I would have, uh, if I was to do this over, I would have chosen maybe a darker blue there, just a, a different color than kind of that skin tone. That color is echoed in other areas, but um, in that section, I don't really like it. Um, yeah, so, you know, there's some craftsmanship issues here and there. Uh, but you know, I was working quickly with the oil pastels. So if I had more time, uh, I'm saying it again, <laughs> I, I would have been a little bit more deliberate with my marks. The green eye, I, I kind of wanted to make that stand out a little bit, but I think it stands out a little bit too much. This green is muted. Um, and that's, that was supposed to be the green that kind of tied that eye in with everything else. And it really looks like a completely different color. It's, so it became local color, didn't it? Right. And then we made it a focal point. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the eye is very strong and your eye is drawn to that eye, but it feels out of place because there's, those colors really aren't in other locations. And that's about all I have to say about that one. All right. <laughs> what, what do you have to say? I, um, I've I've been keeping my own cubist side eye on the chat over here. Oh yeah, and it is it is hilarious. You guys are hilarious. So, I bet it is, particularly with a Picasso portrait. So yeah, um, it's been a lot of fun to read the comments uh, along yeah. while Matt was talking about. This yeah, piece. I agree. It does not look like the nose. <laughs> the, the end of the nose really stood out to me too. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, but but you did you did capture all of the qualities that make it um, make cubism definable. So I think it's successful in that regard. It is a little bit static. It does feel a little bit like Picasso's um, school picture, <laughs> right? You know, if, if he had one. So um, well, the picture I used was a very. It was kind of school picture. -y. Yeah, that's true. Uh, somebody pointed out that young Picasso looks like a Bond villain, and <laughs> uh, that is it's very true. It's it's great. So lo love the love the comments in the chat. And uh, like I said, I think it's a successful piece because it does um, define the style of the, this type of cubism, which is analytic cubism, I think. But I, I agree about your green eye. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on. Ashley's next drawing was the Hopper piece. All right, so the style this of Edward, is my Hopper. Edward Hopper piece in 
oil pastels. And when I think Edward Hopper, I think lonely and quiet. You know, his pieces had a, had a, had that feel to them. Sometimes there was just a single solitary figure. Sometimes there were more figures, but they were never really engaging with one another. They weren't really in conversation. They were like people together in the same room alone, you know? So of course there's no people in here, but just the single solitary coffee cup kind of indicates um, being alone or loneliness. Um, it, it, it does have a bright orange in there. That's really the only bright color, but the orange is a warm color and brown, which is the color that dominates the, uh, the artwork is a, is the warm neutral. So there's some harmony there. And because of the harmony in color, um, I think it still kind of maintains that, that quiet feel to it. I used a set of super cheap oil pastels i think they were the <laughs> cheapest hardest oil pa pastels i could get my hands on and um and and i was fine with that until i got about halfway through the drawing and then i was not really appreciating the way that they mixed together uh, but pushed through and uh you know now that i take another look at it um, I'm less unhappy than I thought I was. Yeah, I, I, I funny like the drawing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and some of those little speckles of paper that show through because it was a little bit more challenging with the harder oil pastels to get the surface covered. Um, I think they I think they contribute to to unity in the artwork. You know, it's not something that I necessarily planned, but it is consistent um, through the piece. So I think that works. I'll tell you what it is. The the grays on the shadow of the cup, I was having a little bit of trouble blending with those because of the hardness of the pastel. So they're they're speckly, more speckly and splotchy, to use a, a word that Matt used earlier in the show, um, with regards to Andy Warhol skin. They got a little Andy Warhol skin going on <laughs> around that coffee cup. Um, but the speckles that showed through the application everywhere else, I think, helped the speckles to feel more intentional than they actually were. So um, that works for me okay. And then at the very end of the process, I just scraped through the oil pastel to make the highlights on the boards that are part of the top of the wooden table. And uh, I felt like that helped pull it together a little bit because those lines kind of disappear and reappear um, from underneath the cloth. So it, I, th I felt like it kind of kind of pulled the table um into the artwork a little bit. It felt a little bit less like a table, more just like some blurry colors back there um, because we can't see the edges of the table or anything like that. So I think that was a, contrib a, a, a small and brief um, factor that contributed to the general success of the piece. Matt's mentioned time, and uh, if I had more time to work on this, I would have continued to work and develop the folds of the cloth. So I feel like if you squint your eyes, you know, you get a really good sense of light on the cloth. Um, but not necessarily some areas in there where I think the form breaks down a little bit. Uh, yeah, I'm going to see what we can do with the napkin on the table here in just a second, or the cloth. Always got uh, an handkerchief. idea. Uh, but uh, first, I want to point out a couple of things. Um, yeah, I think the splotchy nature of the mark making is due to the combination of the surface and the oil pastels that you used. Mm -hmm. Really super cheap oil pastels are not bad. They just make a different mark than some of the more expensive ones that kind of resemble more paint. Yeah. Uh, so kind of the, the lower you go in expense, the more the oil pastels are going to behave like a crayon compared to like a stick of oil paint. Right. Um, right. Good, good and comment. there's a place for both of those types of oil pastels. I've created oil pastel images where I've used those in conjunction with each other because the harder pastels, the ones, the harder oil pastels, the ones that are less pigment rich, are uh, really great for control. You have a lot of control over it, but the oil pastels that are softer, that are more pigment rich, that are more expensive, they're gonna lend to a more looser drawing like we saw in the Picasso drawing. <laughs> um, but I, I do, I can almost argue that this is a monochromatic color scheme. The only, mm -hmm. the only areas that stand out as being different is the highlight on the inside of the cup is a cool highlight and there's a little bit of blue in there. And, um, but if we really think about brown, brown is really a dark orange. When you start mixing black with orange, you get brown. Right. You know, there's not really a dark orange, it just turns brown. So I think that, that monochromatic feel is um, adding to the harmony feel of this piece. Uh, there's a nice 
sense of space in this piece as well, since the uh, the little cracks in the in the table are kind of flowing in this direction, and we've got a little bit of indication of perspective. Mm -hmm. That's adding an illusion of space. But one of the things that really stands out to me about making this, or, or the fact that this piece is strong compositionally, is it's breaking a couple of the rules, but they're tied together in a very certain way. Uh, for example, the napkin barely goes off the edge of the pitcher plane over here, and the coffee mug kind of just barely goes off the edge of the pitcher plane on the right side. If one of those elements did not do that, in other words, if we saw the end of the coffee mug, the handle, then it would feel really heavy on the right or on the that's left true. side. Yeah, that's true. And the opposite of that is true. If we saw the whole napkin, but only saw part of the, ca the, the coffee mug, it would feel really heavy on the right side. So because they're cropped almost in the exact same way, opposite from each other, that's making it feel balanced they, they balance each other that's good there's another really cool thing that's happening here compositionally and that is this s pattern that's happening with the shadow the napkin the coffee mug and the cast shadow over here and that is encouraging a viewer to move through the piece Creates. like this which mm -hmm. is creating a more dynamic and interesting composition for sure. Now, the napkin, I agree with you that uh, it needs a bit more work. And um, honestly, it just needs probably a little bit of value adjustment. So uh, let's let's try the, the burn tool again. Yeah, there we go. Now, we, <laughs> now we've got something the burn tool can grab a hold of. Uh, let me make sure I've got the actual burn tool here. Okay, yeah. Uh, so we'll just make some of the shadows in here a little bit darker just kind of randomly a little bit and see if that can enhance the just to stretch out that range right just make that napkin feel a little bit more interesting with just a little bit of an adjustment so i don't think it needed much but you can see with just that little bit of adjustment how much stronger the yeah, light appears difference. and if you did kind of clean up that splotchiness a little bit and just make that a little bit darker then the light source is way stronger mm -hmm. so that's without it and that's with just a little bit of value adjustment so um i think this is a great piece it, it has an atmospheric feel about it it has that same kind of mood that we see in edward hopper images um, edward hopper of course was very clean with his brushwork uh, so i think the splotchiness kind of falls outside of short that. of the, yeah. the not necessarily short it's just different mm -hmm. than the uh, edward hopper style but the subject matter and the mood it's conveying is definitely spot on. I also like the way that you've muted the browns up here at the top um, by yeah, introducing almost, a little bit of gray. Almost turned gray up there. Yeah, and then again at the bottom, and that's adding a lot of depth to the color and making it look a little bit more believable. One thing about that background, when you squint your eyes at it, there's it almost looks like there's a light stripe and then a dark stripe and then a light diagonal stripe through the you know, through the objects mm -hmm. and then a dark stripe and then another light patch or triangle at the bottom. So there's a little bit of, little bit of, of uh, rhythm in the values, not really in an object repeating, but sort of a light and dark alternating pattern through the background. Yep. I like that. All right. And then my last drawing of the season was uh, in the style of Magritte. And uh, Magritte was a surrealist. And uh, of course, if you know much about Magritte, then you uh, you know they had a lot of apples in, in his <laughs> paintings, and one of his most famous painting was um, the Treachery of Images is the name of the painting I think if I remember correctly, and it is a painting of a pipe, and underneath it it says this is not a pipe in French. So I decided to paint an apple since that is a motif in Magritte's artwork, and then do it in a representational style and then write, this is not an apple in English underneath it. Um, my biggest, I, I love the way I rendered this piece. I was pretty surprised actually that I was able to render it to this level. Yeah, me too. In 45 minutes. But I've got some, uh, there's, there's a couple things that are just glaring at me in this piece that are driving me crazy. And they drove me crazy as soon as I finished the piece. And that is that I decided to make my apple a little bit more organic looking. <laughs> So I brought this edge out a little bit further to make it look more like a believable apple. But Magritte's apples were not like that. They were very symmetrical. Um, every, he, he kind of stylized everything that way, you know, yeah. like pant legs were almost just like, like tubes, like stovepipe tubes, you know, just kind of simplified the shapes a little bit from uh, what we would see with our natural eye. Yeah. So 
this piece, in my opinion, the Apple needs to be uh, more symmetrical. Uh, so that's something that I really can't change, uh, obviously, but it would have been nice if the Apple was consistently round like I've just drawn on the surface, um, on the screen. Uh, the shadow is a little bit rushed down here and it's just pure marker for the most part. I went over the top with, uh, I think, a thin line of black or not black, but a combination of uh, blue and brown. But uh, I feel like the shadow could have been a little bit larger, maybe, uh, maybe more of a shape that mimicked the apple and a little bit smoother. Uh, I think that would have added to the piece. Um, and my lettering down here is not centered <laughs> and it's too far down on the picture plane. Uh, so um, I would have liked it a lot better if um, this was up a little bit further and centered because that is an important element in this piece uh, since that is part of the image that I created. But as far as rendering the apple and the, the materials I used and the process that I used to create this, I was very pleased with uh, the fact that I was able to render it to this level in a short period of time. Um, the highlight's a little splotchy there. I did that with Posca markers and then I toned it down with colored pencils over the top. Uh, in retrospect, I would have probably left that open when I added the markers and then rendered this with colored pencils mm. instead of uh, relying on the Posca markers to uh, add the highlights because that stands out as being a little bit different. Uh, that's my biggest critique for this piece. Um, what What do you have to say? Well, I would I totally agree with the shadow being a little bit too, I guess, um, stark and simple compared yeah. to the surface of that apple. Because yeah. you've got some really subtle marks in there, some really slow changes of value. And uh, so I, I, I wish you did have a little bit more time to work up that shadow. And we said the same thing about the Janet Fish piece. So next season, Matt's going to start with the shadows and then finish <laughs> the object next. No. And, uh, <laughs> So that's about it. And then of course, um, as far as the lettering goes, if you got, if you want to center letters, you got to write them from the center out. And so, or at least that's my experience. I can never pick the right spot to start writing and end in the right place. I would have to count up the letters and the empty spaces between the letters and probably start on the T on the word not and put that one in and then in the very center and then just start working out from there. But when I do that, I also have a tendency to misspell words because I'm not writing the letters in the right order. So um, that's a, uh, uh, that was that's a toughie. That's a toughie. Without putting some more marks down there to kind of lay out those letters, it is a little challenge to get them to land um, right where you hope that they will. Oh, now, now this now is got some rhythm. This is <laughs> this is how you fix it here. I'm just gonna um, just take it right out of that. here. Oh, stamp over it. Yeah, I'm gonna try to it's here. Gone. Let's let's try from this. Side. Oh, Are you in the wrong layer. I'm pushing the wrong buttons. I'm on a PC and I'm used to using um, and a Mac. The Mac for Was for this kind of stuff on a Mac option, I think. I yeah, it's remember. option, and here it's Alt. Uh, so we'll just we'll just take that out, <laughs> and uh, that is way better. The magic of Photoshop. All right. Yes. Oh yeah. That's much better. That's the way it was intended to, the to be. And farther from the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and then your last piece, which you did last week, was the Surratt drawing. Yes. We and I got to use the B paper, B paper company stipple paper. I guess is what it is. And it was my first first drawing. I think I've made on that paper, and I absolutely loved it. Um, I have always been attracted to Surratt's charcoal drawings or sometimes they were Conte drawings. Um, but, uh, nonetheless, you know, it was a black, a black material, um, on kind of a dithery, um, speckly surface. I, I have no idea what type of paper he was using. It probably did not have as small of stipple marks or speckles as the stipple paper does, but he was working larger than I was. So when I brought that down to a six inch by six inch picture, I feel like the pattern of the stipple paper worked really well um, to emulate 
this style and type of charcoal drawings that Surratt did. So for me, I chose him in this subject just to sort of showcase and highlight how unique his charcoal drawing was compared to um, the paintings that are um, were meticulously rendered with dots of color. And so, you know, he's really um, let's see, typecast himself as the, the pointillism guy, the dot guy, and his charcoal drawings are so beautiful. So I just wanted to use my last drawing as a reason and an excuse to introduce them to some folks that may not have seen them before. He typically did do a lot of uh, drawings of people because um, they were a feature in his artwork. Sometimes his scenery had lots and lots of people and sometimes less, but for the most part, his charcoal drawings focused on an individual. There might have been a little bit of a crowd around them so um, I chose a man reading because Surratt had uh, had done a drawing of a man reading and uh, was not able to find a, a copy of that image from Surratt that was a large enough file for me to share at the top of the show um, but uh, if you're more interested in Surratt's drawings and you do a Google search I'm sure you'll run into that drawing on your own computer um, so this was one of my uh, favorite drawings I think um, we had a lot of details we left out and we're able to leave out because we were working in Surratt style. So the ear is just a suggestion, right? The newspaper is just a suggestion. Um, so it was really all about shapes and values uh, to pull this piece off. Yeah, I really uh, love this drawing. I think it definitely looks like a Surratt drawing and that is due in large part to the texture of the paper. And this paper, I, I have created a spooky drawing for Halloween, and I hope to have that video out, Tom, for Halloween, um, on this paper. And um, one, one of the things that I've only used this paper a couple of times, but what I've noticed about this paper is it's very easy to get a range of value very quickly because when we're using graphite or charcoal on a smoother surface, we really have to pay attention to the amount of pressure that we place on the pencil or the charcoal in order to create a range of value that looks consistent. On this paper, because it's so heavily textured, you can make a mark and you already get variety and value just by your mark. Uh, so, and then you can go back and adjust some of the subtleties with just a little bit more pressure. So you, it almost, the image almost comes out of the paper when you're working on it, or at least mm -hmm. that's kind of the experience that I've had. And it's really a surface that you don't want to overwork your artwork on, which I've also learned and experienced. Um, and I think you've done a, a wonderful job exploiting the characteristics of this paper to create the Surratt image. As someone pointed out in the chat, it is definitely atmospheric. We can feel the atmosphere. And I think the reference that you chose is very strong. Um, as we talked about last week, because of the contrast between the light and the dark that's happening in this scene. And in combination with this paper, it makes it, um, it's a great combination to to be able to to capture that contrast between light and dark um this piece is absolutely fantastic uh, the proportions are correct i like the process that you went through by drawing the hard edges with pencil lines first and then going in with the uh the charcoal on the surface to to create this wonderful atmospheric image where we see the details but you know they're not fully explained to us but our mind puts that information together there's a couple of areas that i want to point out where that this is happening with just a few marks and um, the first area is up here in the in the window it feels like we can see buildings and things out there but when you look at it these are really just kind of marks um, contrasting against the white of the paper and of course the texture of the paper is adding that those subtle changes in value that our eye naturally cap captures in reality that are sometimes hard to replicate in a drawing. So the, the service of the paper is really working for you there. Mm, yes. Um, and uh, the ear, again, you mentioned um, it, it is there. We understand it to be there. But if we really cl look, like close at that, look closely at that area, there's no, there's no details there. It's just the subtle changes in value that are giving our, our mind enough information to process. Um, the one thing that it keeps pulling my eye is this area right here. And you let me know what you think about this. Mm -hmm. um, the edge of the newspaper comes down and this dark section is a continuation of that pillar. Right, the background. And I totally understand that in my mind. Uh, when I look at the drawing though, if I don't process that, it feels like this edge 
is an edge that's mimicking the edge of the face. Yeah, do you see the, that? They're the same contour. They are the it's, same it's contour. It's the edge of the the wrinkle in the edge of the newspaper that does that. Right. And uh, that's just. Gosh, I wish you hadn't mentioned that. Now you me. can't unsee it, oh, can you? <laughs> gosh, wait till I get home. I'm going to fix that. Um, so well, I should have probably ch noticed and changed the edge of the. This is again where it's it's good to sometimes break away from the reference. And if I had noticed that in the time, I would have changed that contour of the newspaper so it was doesn't feel like an echo of the cheek. Right. It, and that's exactly what's happening. That's what's making it feel like it's mimicking because that contour is like that. Right. That and this bump. is very similar to that. Yep. And then you've got light and light right next to it. So um, th I think the way to fix that, I think you already know what you could do. You could change the contour of the newspaper a little bit, yep. uh, bring the newspaper over, but then you lose kind of that light against dark. Or change the edge of the newspaper. Yeah, it may not take over much. here. Right. That's 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 what I was yeah. thinking. I would change the newspaper on that side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so those are things that easy fix. Yeah. That you know they just happen when but, you're you know, replicative. When I was making it, you know that's why right. the critiques critique sessions are important for your own artwork for other people's artwork and and maybe having a little space and time between when you made it and when you critique it gives you a chance to see it with a fresh eye. For sure. Um, and that's one of the valuable things about doing this critique is, you know, you create the artwork in the moment, you might like it, you might hate it. And then sometimes you come back and look at it and you might like it or you might hate it. <laughs> but I've learned and I'll never make that mistake again. I'm going to look for parallel contours that, uh, that are confusing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, uh, that was the last episode uh of season 11 um so i would encourage you i think ashley and i are going to choose our favorites that's right i'll yeah. choose one of yours okay. and i'll choose one of mine okay and you can do the same and um i know that some of you have already made comments uh in the comment box which ones you like the best um but do you want me to start or you want yeah, to start? you can go ahead and start um my favorite drawing of the season um that I created was the Janet Fish drawing of oh, yeah. the lamp. That that's right in my style. I felt comfortable with that. And, and you do such a great job with that media combination. Yeah, that's that's a comfort zone for me. Yeah. So um, I was able, and when I you're comfortable with the medium, you can work faster and quicker and more deliberate. Um, and for you. I have two favorites um, from the season, and what do you think they are? Um, I'm going to say the Van Gogh and the Surratt. The Surratt is one of them. Okay. Then, the, gosh, I don't know. I don't know what the second one would be. The other one was... The Piranesi, Dolly, and Edward Hopper. The Edward Hopper piece. Okay. It's, the yeah, Hopper piece. I, yeah. The composition is fantastic yeah, yeah, on that it, piece. It, it, I and was happy with the composition. It does have cool. that. That's a picture I took in my kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes it's easier to take our own picture than it is to search for uh, copyright free content for hours and hours until you find <laughs> just the right exact one. Yeah. It's sometimes so hard to find references. Mm -hmm. um, and then you just, just can create your own if you have the uh, opportunity. But I, I can, I'm yet to be able to create a reference of a lion. Um, so I guess I'll have That's to true. use better references That's there. Right. You can just do like uh, Peter Paul Rubens and just make it up from house cats you've seen. <laughs> right. Boy, his lions are horrible. Or I could just and jump I love in. Peter Paul Rubens. But clearly, he had never seen a lion. He was going by word of mouth. <laughs> um, all right. What about for you? What was okay. your favorite? So we're nearly in agreement. Your Janet Fish is my favorite for you as well. Okay. All you know, right. I love, I love that piece. And when I saw it again today, I was like, oh, wow, that's almost feels like photo photorealism in 45 minutes <laughs> especially that cap with the bottle and the glass work and everything in there the subtle changes in color and then um for me i chose i would have, i would choose the Surratt. i think i would that was your favorite yeah. yeah so yeah, we're yeah. we're nearly in agreement on our favorite pieces interesting this season what was yeah. your second favorite that you created um is it the hopper piece gosh I would probably go, that's a close one. I think I would still go with the Van Gogh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah the Van Gogh drawing. And I think good, it's yeah. partly because I enjoyed drawing the headphones. You know, I thought it was cool. It was like an update to, yeah. uh, um, an update to a Van Gogh artwork. And after that, 
I, I, I started using subject matter that I felt was more in line with what the artist would have chosen. Yeah. You know, so that one was a little bit less in the style of because the subject matter was it's kind of a pun, you know, it's kind of a visual joke. Um, and I kind of like that about it. Well, it's been a great season and yes. uh, we'll be coming at you with another season soon. But uh, like we always do, we take a few weeks off and uh, just continue with our live lessons, um, which, we, which we have. Which a, we need to start in like We have a live minutes. show in nine minutes, another <laughs> live show for members in nine minutes. So if you're a member, we'll see you there in a minute. We got lots of switching around to do, too, between now and then. So. Hopefully we'll we'll be live streaming at eight o'clock. Uh, but if not, it'll just be a couple minutes after. Yeah, just so hang out. Be patient with us because I just looked at the clock and I realized we have gone way over tonight. You know, sometimes I wonder how are we going to talk about our artwork for an hour? We talked about it for an hour when we make it, and then when we, when we start, we can't stop. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. Um, and I'll remind you, like I said at the beginning of the broadcast, I'm working on putting together all the videos from season five onward. This was season 11 that we just finished, and I'm gonna be putting those on the blog. I hope to have season five published tomorrow, and then the days that follow, season six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11. So um, if you wanna watch all of the previous seasons back to season five, uh, they'll be on the blog at thevirtualinstructor.com very soon. And of course, if you wanna be notified when new lessons are posted, uh, make sure you sign up to be on the newsletter list. Again, there's a link in the description below for that as well. Like, subscribe, do all that stuff, guys. It's been a wonderful season. Uh, we're open to suggestions for what you'd like to see next season. Each season we have a theme. Uh, we have no idea what the theme's gonna be next season, but it's gonna be fun like it always is. So thanks for joining us for season 11. With that, we're gonna go ahead and sign out for this evening. Good night, everybody.